little children of God through faith. <clears throat> as many of us as were baptized into Christ have clothed ourselves with Christ. We, are no, long, we no longer tolerate divisions between rich and poor, black and white, male and female, citizen and immigrant, queer and straight. We are all... through the voice of the church to enter upon the ministry of word and sacrament. Can you hear the heavens? Yes, yes they They're are telling, telling the, the glory, glory of God. God. Can you hear the firmament? Yes, yes it, it proclaims, proclaims God's handiwork. Throughout every single day, God's, God's speech, speech pours, pours forth, forth. God's knowledge is declared. Let the words of our mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and The mouth of the Lord has spoken. Our sins are as evident as blood on snow. We are unwilling and disobedient. We speak words of goodness, yet shake hands with evil. We proclaim justice, yet benefit from oppression. Our sins are many and manifold, and we cannot wash our own hands. Clothed in our baptism with Christ, let us approach God together in the silent prayer of confession.
God sweeps away our transgressions like a cloud on a winter day. Our sins are like momentary mist. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, God redeems us. Our sins are forgiven. Let us pray. Holy God, the source of life and love, grant that the words we hear will speak to our hearts and minds as your word made known to us in Jesus the Christ. Amen. The reading from the Hebrew Scriptures, Genesis 21 verses 8 to 19. The child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast on that day that Isaac was weaned. But Sarah saw the son of Hagar the Egyptian, whom she had born to Abraham, playing with her son Isaac. So she said to Abraham, Cast out this slave woman with her son, for the son of this slave woman shall not inherit along with my son Isaac. The matter was very distressing to Abraham on account of his son. But God said to Abraham, Do not be distressed because of the boy and because of your slave woman. Whatever Sarah says to you, do as she tells you. For it is through Isaac that offspring shall be named for you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and took bread and a skin of water and gave it to Hagar, putting it on her shoulder along with the child and sent her away. And she departed and wandered about in the wilderness of Beersheba. When the water in the skin was gone, she cast the child under one of the bushes. Then she went and sat down opposite him a good way off, about the distance of a bow shot, for she said, Do not let me look on the death of the child. And as she sat opposite him, she lifted up her voice and wept. And God heard the voice of the boy, and the angel of God called to Hagar from heaven and said to her, What troubles you, Hagar? Do not be afraid, for God has heard the voice of the boy where he is. Come, lift up the boy, and hold him fast with your hand, for I will make a great nation of him. Then God opened her eyes, and she saw a well of water. She went and filled the skin with water and gave the boy a drink. So ends the lesson.
This reading is 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Now the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will renounce the faith by paying attention to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons, through the hypocrisy of liars whose consciences are seared with a hot iron. They forbid marriage and demand abstinence from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected, provided it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by God's word and by prayer. This ends the reading.
We'll turn now to the Gospel of Matthew, reading the first eight verses of chapter 12. At that time, Jesus went through the grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, and they began to pluck heads of grain and to eat. When the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Look, your disciples are doing what is not lawful on the Sabbath. He said to them, Have you not read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and ate bread of the, of the presence, which is not lawful for him or his companions to eat, but only for the priests. Or have you not read in the law that on the Sabbath the priests in the temple break the Sabbath and yet they're guiltless? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. But if you had known what this means, I desire mercy and not sacrifice, you would not have condemned the guiltless. For the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. I invite you to pray with me. Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. The very first time that Robert and I talked about this whole call to ministry thing, we were right underneath this sanctuary. We were downstairs in the fellowship hall, and uh, it just kind of came about and going back and forth. And, and of course, at first, Robert kind of had that, oh, no, you know. But then, but then pretty soon, in, in proper Robert fashion, he sat up real straight, and he got real serious, and we had a conversation. And I knew that even though there was that sense of like, oh, I don't really want to go there. I, I could see so clearly and obviously in him and through him that he's called by God to serve the church. But if we're being honest, we'll admit that we understand why Rob didn't jump at the chance. Yeah, some of us are just slower than others. But for real, the church is a difficult place all kinds of rules and red tape. There's all kinds of structures. There's committee meetings and politics and demands and opinions and emotions. And I suppose if we find a place to squeeze it in, there's also Jesus. All of our scripture passages today shed light on the purpose of the church. Jesus, he finds himself in a tough spot in, in the telling of Matthew's story. He's, he's being claimed as the Messiah. People are beginning to see this in him. And, and, but yet, they're skeptical. There's so many people that are like, well, that really can't be him. Well, that's not what he was supposed to look like. Well, he, are you sure? And then these Pharisees, they, you know, they've got all this law stuff going on, and they start getting worried, and so do all the government rulers, because they're like, well, if this really is him, you know what? So many people are following, so we have to pay attention somehow. And, and so people wanted to trap him. They wanted to do everything they could to stop him. If this is really the Messiah, the Son of God, he can stand above that, right? He'll be able to get through these traps we set. So they set all kinds of different traps. And, and this uh, text in Matthew is we find him being trapped again. He breaks rules on the Sabbath, and they think they've got him. The Pharisees say, aha, uh -huh. but you see, Jesus, it's not lawful to harvest grain on the Sabbath. But as he often does, Jesus throws it back in their faces. Have you not read what David did? Can't you just see it? Like, can you not read what David did? I mean, of course they read what David did. These were the Pharisees. They were smart. They were religious. They knew the Old Testament. They knew what David did. They read it. But have you read it and understood it? Ah, yes. That's the ticket. We can't be the church. We can't even be Christians if we don't understand how we are to live. And if we think that staying out of hell and getting into heaven is the goal, we're actually really missing the boat just like those Pharisees. You see, the Pharisees, they followed rules. They followed them to a T most of the time. Actually, there's a few spots in the temple where they catch them having money in their pockets and they're not supposed to. So sometimes they broke them too. But those rules were made to benefit the Pharisees. They were the ones that were going to gain from everybody obeying all of these Sabbath rules, all of these temple rules. It was all for the Pharisees. But once they are confronted by their own traditions, they aren't looking so mighty anymore. 
You see, sure enough, there's all these highly respected kings and priests and prophets who broke the Sabbath. And now the Son of God himself is breaking the Sabbath. Why? Ministry is not about righteousness. Doing what we claim is good is not what ministry is all about. There's two places in Matthew's text where he depicts Jesus as saying to the people, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The first is when they're chastising him for sitting and eating with sinners in their home, and the second is now in the grain field as they're eating on the Sabbath. And he says to them both times, to the Pharisees and to his disciples and to all those that can hear, I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And this, this, my friends, is where we have a problem. We humans tend to like things easy, at least our way, right? That's the same then, and it's the same now. We like to have things the way we think they should be. An interesting analogy I just uh, discovered today was uh, my son, I was offering my son an apple or an orange. I was offering I had both of them in front of him, he could pick whichever he wanted. And wouldn't you believe, when he took that apple and he turns around and he walks away with it, he gave no thought to that orange. Not a single thought to that orange. And if we apply this analogy to the church and its purpose, I think Jesus would find this very logic acceptable. Except it's not fruit, it's people. Jesus didn't cater to any one rule or any one group of people. Jesus catered to the masses. After all, it was good news of great joy for all people. So we might think sometimes that, you know, we can just sit back. You know, we're, we're, we're not like those Pharisees. We're not like those people that were yelling, crucify, crucify him. We, we're doing okay. We, you know, we give to some people every now and then, and we hold doors open. And, and, and so, you know, we're really, we're really not doing that stuff that Jesus is criticizing. And I ask us to check ourselves on that. Are we doing those things that Jesus is criticizing? Think about all of our laws. We've got gun laws. We've got tax laws. We've got birth control laws. We've got immigration laws. We've got poverty laws. And usually we find ourselves on one side or the other of opinion for each of those laws. And I want us to ask ourselves, how often do we ever consider the people on the other side? How often do we consider the people that are most affected by these laws? We can hold opinions and we can have a righteous feeling about why we hold those opinions, but there will always be somebody who's affected in a negative way by our feelings, our emotions, and our beliefs. Robert and I had talked a little bit as he was going through the uh, call process. After you're ordained, you, you know, you, after you graduate from seminary, you... Uh, it's been a while. Um, you, you, <laughs> after you graduate from seminary, you look for a call and you, you interview with different churches. And Robert interviewed with several churches, and we had a conversation one time about those. And you know, he said that, it, that many times, the excuse people would give him to not even not even have a con actually, some people didn't even answer his email. He didn't even get an answer. But other people would answer him, and they'd say, "Oh, we we want somebody with more experience. We don't want somebody that's right out of seminary." And uh, so I, it was interesting. I've got a couple people I know that are working on PNCs right now. And, and so I had the chance to talk to one, and I, you know, I said, how, how's it going? You know, how are your candidates? How are you finding them to be? Are you excited about who you interview? And we're talking, and, and pretty soon he says, yeah, you know, and, and we had a gay candidate, too, um, somebody that wanted to talk to us. But, you know, we're just not ready for that. Now, me, I am so sick and tired of that lazy excuse. So I hopped right on that opportunity, and I said, tell me, ready for what? And you all got a little nervous. Well, you know, a gay pastor. So I kept going. No, I don't know. Are they less educated? Do they have horns? What? What is it that you're saying you're not ready for? Of course, the conversation quickly ended. But what I challenged my friend to think about is that what you are saying here is that you're not ready for a gay pastor, but you are ready for injustice. It's not okay to have a gay pastor, but it's okay to stifle someone's God-given call. Think about it. Our Christian priorities are messed up. If 
we think for a second that our opinions and our attitudes and the way we carry ourselves, that they're holy, they're a sacrifice we accept on belief of living a godly life, we're not understanding the life and the ministry of Jesus Christ. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Mercy is compassion that you could otherwise withhold from an individual. I desire mercy. I desire compassion. Hagar, in the Old Testament reading, her dignity as a human being and as somebody of worth was lost in the self-pride of another human being. But her dignity was found in God, in God's care, in God's love, in God's furthering to carry her son into a life of leadership. So let us make no mistake about it. Every time that we drop the ball there and, and we forget about other people and we put ourselves on top of it and the way we want things to go, every time we do that, that person's love, that person's dignity, that person's compassion is found in God. And if we claim that we want to be a people that follow this God, by golly, we've got to try to get in sync with that. So Rob, I get it. I get why it took you so much time to finally get here. There are too many opinions in the church. There's never enough money. There's fragile feelings. There's self-pride. Telling people to think beyond themselves is not an easy task. In fact, Jesus lost his life because of it. Jesus lost his life because people weren't willing to put aside their own rules, their own hard hearts, their own self-pride. But you know, we're smarter than that. We've got history to show us what took place and what came of it. And we have biblical knowledge. We can understand these scriptures. And we are called to do better. We are called to continue the ministry of Jesus Christ on earth. That is, go out into the world and unpack God from that nice little box society has made. The closest God has ever come to a box, by the way, is a manger. Christ was set there for a brief moment as an infant, but we all know he didn't stay. He grew, he lived, he experienced life. And then he learned and he taught and he challenged. He set for us an example of godly intention and expectation. That means we need to do the same. We got to pick the grain. We got to feed people. We got to upset that apple cart. We got to bring compassion where there's otherwise hatred. We got to bring, it means we got to be heretics. We got to be called rebels. We got to make a little mess and make a little noise and get out there for the sake of justice and live as Jesus lived in the world, loving sinners, loving ourselves enough to put ourselves aside and be who God has asked us to be, to be who God has empowered us to be by the Holy Spirit. That's what makes us the church. Not the church of Grand Rapids, not the church of Moorhead, not the church of, of you know, Texas, not the church of from out east or out west. But that's what makes us the church of Jesus Christ. When we stand up together, when we stand up when others are afraid, heck, when we stand up when we're afraid, and we stand as a voice of hope and love and mercy in a world that so greatly needs it. Let's be the church.
Today's offering goes to the Committee on Preparation for Ministry at the Presbytery of Northern Waters in their continual effort to fund the education of candidates for ministry of word and sacrament. Jesus told his disciples that because they receive the gift of grace without payment, they in turn ought to give without payment. Please be as generous as you are able.
may be seated. <clears throat> Please join me as we read 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 8 and 11 responsively. God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's Spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God herself is behind it all. Each person is giving something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. We are called into the Church of Jesus Christ by baptism and marked as Christ's own by the Holy Ghost. This is our common calling, to be disciples and servants of our Lord. Within the community of the Church, some are called to particular service as ministers of word and sacrament, as elders, and as deacons. Recognizing the importance of each office, the Church ordains in order to assure fulfillment of the primary responsibilities of preaching the word and administering the sacraments, ordering the governance of the church, and providing for ministries of care and compassion in the world. Representing the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church, the Presbytery of Northern Waters, by means of this commission, now ordains Robert Drake to the ministry of word and sacrament. Please rise. <clears throat> Let us reaffirm the covenant that was made at each and every one of our baptisms. Ordination, ordination calls the whole church to renewed commitment and reminds us all to bear gladly the yoke of Christ given in the covenant of baptism. Let us therefore reaffirm our baptismal vows, renouncing all that opposes God and God's rule and affirming the faith of the Holy Catholic Church. Trusting in the gracious mercy of God, do you turn from the ways of sin and renounce evil and its power in the world? Do. do you turn to Jesus Christ and accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior, trusting in God's grace and love? I do. Will you be Christ's faithful disciple obeying Christ's word and showing Christ's love. I will, with God's help. Remember your baptism and be thankful. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. You may be seated. Robert, as you prepare to take on the ministry of word and sacrament, you trust in Jesus Christ, your Savior, acknowledge him Lord of all and head of the church, and through him believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I do. Do you accept the scriptures of the Old and the New Testament to be by the Holy Spirit, the unique and authoritative witness to Jesus Christ in the church universal? and God's word to you. I do. Do you sincerely receive and adopt the essential tenets of the Reformed faith as expressed in the confessions of our church as authentic and reliable expositions of what scripture leads us to believe and do? And will you be instructed and led by those confessions as you lead the people of God? I do. Will you fulfill your ministry in obedience to Jesus Christ under the authority of scripture and be continually guided by our confessions. I will. 
Will you be governed by our church's polity, and will you abide by its discipline? Will you be a friend among your colleagues in ministry, working with them, subject to the ordering of God's word and spirit? I will. Will you in your own life seek to follow the Lord Jesus Christ, love your neighbors, and work for the reconciliation of the world? I will. Do you promise to further the peace, unity, and purity of the church? I do. Will you pray for and seek to serve the people with energy, intelligence, imagination, and love? I will. Will you be a faithful minister of the word and sacrament, <clears throat> proclaiming the good news in word and sacrament, teaching faith and caring for people? Will you be active in government and discipline, serving in the councils of the church? And in your ministry, will you try to show the love and the justice of Jesus Christ? I will. I invite all ordained elders, deacons, clergy, regardless of your denominational affiliation, to come forward and, in, and lay hands on Robert. Let us pray. Gracious and eternal God, with joy we give you all thanks and praise. Throughout the ages you have been faithful to your covenant people whom you called out of bondage and redeemed to be your own. In every time and place you have chosen servants from among your people to point the way to salvation. We are grateful for ancestors in the faith who followed without fear, placing their trust in you alone. We give thanks for judges and monarchs who ruled in righteousness and peace. We praise you for prophets and apostles who spoke your bold words of mercy and truth. We thank you for pastors and teachers who have nurtured your people in faith and faithfulness. Above all, we praise you for Jesus Christ who came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life to set others free. Anointed by your Holy Spirit, he proclaimed your reign on earth, revealing your saving love in all he said and did. Gracious God, pour out your Spirit upon your servant Robert, whom you call by baptism as your own. Grant him the same mind that was in Christ Jesus, Give him the spirit of truthfulness rightly to proclaim your word in Christ from pulpit, table, and font, and in the words and action of daily living. Give him the gifts of your Holy Spirit to build up the church, to strengthen the common life of your people, and to lead with compassion and vision. In the walk of faith and for the work of ministry, Give to your servant, Robert, and to all who serve as pastors among your people, gladness and strength, discipline and hope, humility, humor, and courage, and an abiding sense of your presence. Amen. Robert, you are now a minister of word and sacrament in the Church of Jesus Christ. Be faithful and true in your ministry <coughs> so that your whole life will bear witness to the crucified and risen Christ.
sort of feels like this church has changed a lot since I was here. It's also formal and uptight today. Uh, there's somebody crawling under the pew. That makes me feel better. <laughs> like most of you gathered here today, you have known, we've known Robert for many years. One of the first things I did with Robert uh, was not eat for 30 hours and sleep on the church floor. And no, that was not when he was a teenager, although if I do my math right, that could have been when he was a teenager. <laughs> Uh, but it was when he was the youth minister here with CPC, and I was at United and Superior. After that, I had the great pleasure of being the chair of the Presbyterian Committee on Preparation for Ministry during Robert's almost entire tenure uh, as an inquirer and candidate. So I got to work with him um, and through the call process and through the seminary years and so forth, and it was a great delight, Robert, to be part of it. So even a special honor to be here today. And let me also just take this opportunity to thank the congrega this congregation, um, the support and contact that you kept in touch with Robert throughout the whole time he was out at Princeton is really admirable and much appreciated by Robert, I'm sure. It can be pretty lonely out there, well, at any seminary, studying and reading books and forgetting what the church is all about sometimes. So your prayers and support and keeping in touch, much appreciated by Robert and by the Presbytery of Northern Waters. So there's this memo floating around the internet, going from session to session, I understand. Uh, the Moorhead session probably has received a copy of it. Maybe CPC received a copy of it. Actually, I think it was floating around when I was ordained as well. Uh, but in those days, we had carbon paper and mimeograph machines, so <laughs> it didn't get so widely distributed as it can today. So Robert, I thought I would share this with you. It says, Dear Pastor, tell us the truth. Tell us the truth when you don't know the answer to our questions, and your humility will set the example as we seek them out together. Tell us the truth about your doubts, and we will feel safe sharing our own. Tell us the truth when you get tired, when the yoke grows too heavy and the hill too steep to climb, and we will learn to carry one another's burdens because we started with yours. Pastor, tell us the truth when you are sad, and we, too, will stop pretending. Robert, tell us the truth when your studies lead you to new ideas that might stretch our faith and make us uncomfortable. And those of us who stick around will never forget that you trusted us with a challenge. Tell us the truth when your position is controversial, and we will grow braver along with you. Pastor, tell us the truth when you need to spend time on your marriage, and we will remember to prioritize ours. Tell us the truth when you fail, and we will stop expecting perfection. Tell us the truth when you think that our old ways of doing things need to change. And though we may push back, the conversation will force us to examine why we do what we do, and perhaps inspire something even greater. Tell us the truth when you fall short, and we will drop our measuring sticks. Tell us the truth when all that's left is hope, and we will start digging for it. Tell us the truth when the world requires radical grace, and we will generate it. Tell us the truth even if it's surprising, disappointing, painful, joyous, unexpected, unplanned, and unresolved, and we will learn that this is what it means to be people of faith. Pastor Robert, tell us the truth, and you won't be the only one set free. Telling the truth, this was written by Rachel Held Evans and distributed around the church. Robert, welcome to this ministry. I invite you all to stand and join in singing, O God, Beyond All Praising, found on the insert.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give our thanks to the Lord our God. With joy, we praise you, gracious God. For you created heaven and earth, made us in your image, and continue making us anew in your image every day. We give thanks for Jesus Christ, our Lord, who by his life, death, and resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life, a life without fear. Therefore, we proclaim our faith as signed and sealed in this sacrament. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night that he was arrested, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, And he said, this cup is the new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink this cup, do this in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat this bread and we drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of the risen Lord until he comes again. The gifts of God for the people of God. God. Communion will be by intinction. You will come down the center aisles and return on the side aisles. And there is also a gluten-free option. Please simply ask for gluten-free. You may come forward.
Lord God, in gratitude for this meal, we give ourselves to you in body and in spirit. Lead us out to live as changed people, having shared the living bread and wine. We cannot remain the same. Amen. should have done this earlier, but was having respiratory problems. So, please welcome our newest Minister of Word and Sacrament. Go now throughout this night and this week and your, the rest of your life, never doubting the spirit of the voice of God and always being surprised to whom and through whom God speaks. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord turn his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn her face towards you and give you peace. Amen. After you, moderator.